I'm Avery Davidson. Thank you for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, the only TV show bringing Louisiana farmers and consumers together every week. My partner, Kristen Oaks White, has the week off. We begin this week with the continuing coverage of the farm disaster occurring in the Midwest. With more than one million acres underwater, Nebraska agricultural officials tell media outlets the estimated damage from the flooding is $400 million to crops and another $400 million to livestock. Satellite data analyzed for Reuters shows the bomb cyclone weather event left wide swaths of nine major grain producing states underwater. Farms from the Dakotas to Missouri and beyond have been underwater, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is warning this spring could be an unprecedented flood season as it forecasts heavy spring rains and cites flooding conditions already seen along major river basins. The report shows nearly 1.1 million acres of cropland and more than 84,000 acres of pasture land in the Midwest was covered with floodwaters for at least seven days between March 8th and March 21st. Iowa is number one in U.S corn production and number two in soybeans. It was also the state that had the most water, covering more than 474,000 acres. None of the grains that were in storage and now flooded are covered by any existing federal program. Meanwhile, cattle losses may have long-term effects on the price you pay for beef. The water from the Midwest is working its way down the Mississippi River and coming here, but the losses in the fields have worked their way into the hearts of farmers and ranchers all across Louisiana. Twyla's Neil Malasson traveled to one co-op in Slaughter, Louisiana, where truckloads of hope and fellowship are on their way right now to Nebraska. It's a pretty day in Slaughter, Louisiana. Here at the Tri-Parish Co-op, though, they're thinking of people 1,500 miles away who aren't seeing such a mild spring. That's why they started a collection for farm and ranch supplies to be trucked there. According to General Manager Donnie Cupid, once word got out, the donations poured in. The amazing thing was it was all voluntary. We just put the word out that we were doing it, and the donations started to flow in. It's taking three trucks to haul 80,000 pounds of cattle protein tubs, old corn, barbed wire, fencing, and other supplies. Cattle producer Amelia Kent helped coordinate with folks in Nebraska. She experienced flooding in 2016 here and drew upon her experience to help get producers there what they need. Whereas we've made um, a lot of efforts in years past with other disasters to move hay for this specific disaster, um, it, se it seemed like feed and supplements were the more natural fit. A lot of hay is already being moved from states that are near to Nebraska than we are. Word got out as far as Iberville Parish, where sugarcane grower Jennifer Mistretta said she wanted to do anything she could to help. Besides the economic impact, it's just, it's to me, it's more personal as to what it means to those farmers and ranchers, because this is what I grew up in. I grew up on a farm. My husband and I still farm. It's not just a living. It's not just out there making a living. It's a lifestyle. And more than that, it's our life. I mean, we're we're rooted in it. The effort took less than two days to get together, and a lot of the salespeople at the co-op work to get it done. As the last bits get loaded, you can feel the sense of relief here. When it all started coming together, it was just like overjoy. You know, I got up this morning and I said, thank you, God, for letting us get this far. Let's pray. Pastor Josh Morris is leading a final prayer here, both for the convoy and the folks in the Midwest. He led relief efforts in 2016 as well. So did Nick Smith, who is now on his 23rd relief convoy since Hurricane Katrina hit 15 years ago. He says it's the lessons from the farm that move him. I had 10 or 12 loads after Katrina, and we hauled hay down south after the 16 floods. We hauled hay to Wharton, Texas after 17 floods. Went to the Panhandle after the wildfires. Went to Georgia after Hurricane Michael last October. And my daddy has always said that if you're not able to help somebody, it's, it's one thing. He said, but if you're able to help somebody and you can't, you got a big problem. The crew that went to Nebraska made it safely there the next day before turning around to come home. Also, a sister co-op store in Woodville, Mississippi, held a similar relief effort and joined in that convoy to help their fellow farmers and ranchers. And Avery, they need all the help I, they can get up there. I mean, you could see all that devastation from the video we showed earlier, and they said that this relief effort is just a drop in a bucket, but, you know, if everybody can come together and do this, maybe it'll make an impact up there. I know when we had our flooding here, 
Louisiana Farm Bureau Livestock Advisory Committee went ahead and activated its hay clearinghouse. That wouldn't re really apply in this because, like Amelia said, they don't really use our hay, but our folks don't have a whole lot of hay here. No, and that's that's the only, I guess, bright spot in all that, that they really need those those protein pellets to feed their, feed, feed their cattle. But the biggest thing that they need, according to the uh, folks there at the co-op, is fencing. Mm -hmm. Not just repairing fencing, but replacing it wholesale. Those floods just washed all that stuff away. Well, we'll continue to pray for them and hope that they can rebuild and offer whatever help we can. Thank you very much, Neil Melanson. We mentioned the waters from the Midwest making their way down the Mississippi. That's significant because the river is already in flood, contained by the levees running through Louisiana. To ease the pressure on levees in New Orleans, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has water from the Mississippi flowing through the Bonnie Carey Spillway into Lake Pontchartrain. The Corps opened 28 bays at the spillway on February 27th. That diverted 23,000 cubic feet of water per second out of the Mississippi River. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers continued opening bays of the spillway until March 11th. This structure exists to protect New Orleans. The Corps' decision is based on the flow of the Mississippi River, with the goal of it not allowing it to exceed 1.25 million cubic feet per second in New Orleans. However, as the river has fallen, the Corps has closed bays of the Bonnie Carey Spillway to match. As of Wednesday, April 3rd, the day we're shooting this show, the Corps has closed 71 bays of the 206 it had opened. Dr. Chris Brantley is the project manager at the Bonnie Carey Spillway for the Corps of Engineers. He says the pace at which the Corps closes bays is dependent on the river. The river is going to dictate what we do as far as bay operations. Rising hydrograph, we will open bays, allow excess water into the spillway. As it starts to decline, then we'll start to close bays. And right now, we're kind of in a standstill operation, uh, waiting for the river to fall enough that we can start to close additional bays. Brantley says it may be a while before the Corps closes all of the bays, doing so at a pace that accounts for the regular spring swell from heavy rains and the snow melt. The Corps has never had to open the spillway, begin closing bays, and then turn around and reopen bays in the same season. The Louisiana beef cattle industry has a $464 million impact on the state's economy, according to the latest LSU Ag Center Ag Summary. That's a good hunk of change, but there's a state north of here that has nearly four times the number of beef cattle than we have here in Louisiana. That state is Missouri, which is why the Louisiana Farm Bureau Livestock Advisory Committee chose to go there for the 2019 beef tour. There's beauty in the hills of southwest Missouri. There's also a very valuable industry, beef cattle. David Cope is the superintendent of the University of Missouri Southwest Research Center. He's guiding more than 30 Louisiana cattle ranchers on part of their tour of the Show Me State. The beef industry is, is very important to the state of Missouri. It's uh, been said that 40% of the farm proceeds in some form or, or fashion are related to the beef industry, whether that be fertilizer, feed, seed, uh, chemicals, first one thing and the other. You know, there's lots of uh, folks that are uh, truck drivers that, that haul cattle in and out of the state. Many of those truck drivers are coming here. This is the Joplin Regional Stockyards. More than 500,000 head of cattle are sold here. Owner Jackie Moore has his own ranch, J.K. Moore Ranch in Mount Vernon, Missouri. Moore buys 1,000 head of cattle every week conditions them to go to the feed yards and sells them. Moore's neighbors at the Wilmoth Ranch have a much more data-driven approach. We're from Missouri. We are the show me state, so we had to prove this system to ourselves, and we did it with trial and error. Office manager Kathy Wilmoth oversees the commercial herd and 200 head of registered Angus. Once we get that genomic profile, we use that along with looking at the dam's records the sire's records, we look at that individual profile, and then we go as far, and we go on past that to look at that individual animal, of course, what we see in the field. And we have cutoff points for all of those areas that allow us to create what we would like to think is an above average commercial female. Two and a half to three pounds of grain a day. Mitch Marsalis raises cattle in Claiborne Parish, Louisiana. The Hereford herd at Jernigan Ranch in Mountain Grove, Missouri interests him, not because of the breed, but because of who now owns the ranch. Here at Jernigan Ranch, where we are right now, they turn this ranch over to the university as a donation, and it has been run by the same ranch manager that was here 
since the very beginning, and this run is a business. They do not get any money out of the general fund and they run it strictly as a business. Louisiana Farm Bureau Livestock Advisory Committee Chairman Marty Woodridge helped organize this trip. He hopes the women and men on the 2019 beef tour learned a thing or two. I want them to take back that uh, extension and research is alive and well in the state of Missouri. I want them to take back that there's a lot of value in trying to get our cattle up to those 7, 800, 900 weight cattle before we sell it. The industry is alive and well and people are really taking steps to make sure that the industry stays alive and well for future generations. As you saw, this was an exciting trip for these Louisiana ranchers. Next week, we'll take you to the final stop on the beef tour, the College of the Ozarks. This small school just outside of Branson, Missouri, is known as Hard Work U and grew its agriculture program out of necessity. It's a really neat story and an impressive stop for the 2019 beef tour. Forestry students from across the southeast headed to the Bayou State to camp out at the LSU Ag Center's Botanic Garden at Burden. They traveled to participate in the 62nd Southern Forestry Conclave. As Craig Gotro shows us, the event featured competitive forestry contests and a great chance to network with other students and prospective employers. Students from 14 Southern Forestry schools participated in competitive logging events, tested their technical skills, and networked with potential employers during the 62nd Southern Forestry Conclave. Nearly 200 students camped out for three days at the LSU Ag Center's Botanic Gardens at Burden to compete and to pass a good time. They have some fun doing it, they have some fun learning, and uh, it's learning beyond the classroom and, and gives them a purpose for some of that learning that they do. The event has both a social and professional component allowing students to mingle with their peers and graduate faculty. Forest industry representatives are in attendance, and for some students, the event serves as an informal job interview. They can network with each other, network with other advisors, um, show off a bunch of technical and physical skills related to forestry. Um, so there is the brains and the bronze of this event. Students had the potential of learning important skills and making valuable contacts. They were encouraged to attend as many conclaves as possible. I would recommend any freshman forester go into conclave. You might have to step out of your comfort zone but you need to start going because you start meeting people, you start making friends, and I wish I started when I was a freshman. The friendships you make here will definitely carry on later in life and into the workforce, so I think you're building some strong bonds. <laughs> Cameron Carney was competing in the log burling contest. He believed quickness was the key to victory. Making the first move, so you want to be the one to make the log start moving first, and you kind of want to be in control of how it's moving, and that helps you be in control more of the situation. Next year's conclave will be in Knoxville, Tennessee. It is usually held in March to coincide with spring break. With the LSU accent, this is Craig Gotro reporting. A total of 20 competitive events were held during the three-day event. Eight of the events highlighted technical skills, while the rest were more physical, like the guy you saw scaling the tree with his bare feet. That just seemed painful. The 2019 legislative session, speaking of painful, the 2019 legislative session will officially begin Monday, April 8th. As Twyla's Carl Wiggers explains, this session should be interesting to watch as it unfolds, thanks to a new farm bill which could open the door to a new crop for Louisiana farmers. In just a few short days, this building will be buzzing with excitement as the 2019 legislative session begins. This year's session is a fiscal session, meaning the state's budget is on the table. It's also an election year for many lawmakers in this building, all the way up to the governor's office. According to Louisiana Farm Bureau legislative specialist Joe Mapes, this will make for an interesting year in the state capitol. Well, typically when we talk about an election year cycle, as far as the legislature is concerned, we talk about um, you know issues not being as prevalent and high profile and controversial because these men and women want to get reelected. However, uh, we've got some really high profile issues in this session that we're going to deal with. Clay Sheck Snyder from District 81 chairs the House Agriculture Committee. He is one of those men up for re-election. Some legislators are going to have to worry about being voted back into their district and coming back and representing the state. They don't want to step on too many toes. So caution lightly on, on what the issues are that they need to, to support. And uh, I don't think you'll see too many people hold back, though. I think you'll, you'll see a good many uh, state reps that are, have another term to go that'll be back, and they'll, they'll, uh, they'll push a few buttons. Commissioner of Agriculture and Forestry Dr. Mike Strain says that new taxes should not be a concern, but taxing farm inputs is still on his team's radar. One of the things we have to look at is some of the issues concerning 
uh, the taxes on inputs by the non-farmer shareholder on farms and that's one of the issues we're going to have to address. An example of this scenario is when a farmer and landlord, a shareholder who is separate and distinct from that farmer, share costs of farm inputs. That's similar to the issue of the commercial farmer's ID card. That's a law that requires farmers who earn income from agriculture to apply for, receive, and present a card when purchasing farm inputs to receive their tax exemption. According to MAPES, this is currently quite confusing for farmers, but it should be cleared up during this session. Along with the Farmer's ID card, MAPES and Louisiana Farm Bureau will be watching closely bills concerning the right to repair, running waters and land rights, and finally the discussion of both medical marijuana and industrial hemp, which are two very distinct issues. Industrial hemp was designated an agricultural commodity in 2018 by the Federal Farm Bill, and uh, we want to support any legislation that would put that tool on our farmer's belt, another rotational crop that they could uh, factor into their production. I think with our plan that we have with our bill, you know, with Farm Bureau's help, with LSU and the commissioner's help, I think we have a plan that will be effective and it will be secure for the future to move our state forward. With all of these agricultural issues and the political dynamics in the Capitol, we will certainly be watching this session closely for you keeping you up to date here on Twyla. However, if you want more Louisiana politics, especially as it relates to agriculture, head over to our website at twylatv.org and follow the link to sign up for our weekly grassroots government newsletter. There we'll have an update from Joe Mapes, who you just met, and others here at Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation, keeping you up to speed on what is happening or not happening each week during the session. And Avery, this is one of the things that we've started. We've done it over the history of Farm Bureau. We've mm -hmm. kind of let people know what we're doing and we've always been about representing our membership at the Capitol. But this grassroots government project has been really fun because it's exactly what Farm Bureau is about mm -hmm. and it's a huge benefit to our membership that we're highlighting every week and we're saying, hey, this is what happened today. And that's one mm -hmm. of the things that I asked Joe, every day, what's going on today? And it's mm -hmm. really fun to do. And it's great to have Joe's sort of background because, I mean, he grew up around the Capitol. His father, Bud Mapes, was one of the most uh, prolific lobbyists there. And so for, for Joe to follow in those footsteps, I'm sure you love hearing the historical perspective oh on all gosh. that. I've learned so much over the last few years about, you know, why this tax was put in place or where this tax went or how it got away or what this law is here for, or why they do it this way. It's, it's fascinating to me. And, um, it's a lot to learn, but it's one of the really, <laughs> we have a great teacher in Joe, and uh, one of the things I really like about Joe is he's always there at the Capitol. He's always there representing Farm Bureau, and he always says at the end of his segments on uh, grassroots government, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. You're on the menu, and Joe Mapes does a great job of keeping us at the table, so it's, it's nice. Well, you do a great job of keeping us informed. Thank you very much, Carl Wiggers. Still to come on Twyla, wabbit season, duck season? No, it's crawfish season, so we're going to check prices around the state just for you. But first, how far would one drive to keep crawfish in supply in Farmerville, Louisiana? Stay with us. I know I hope they're biting today. I hope they are. Find your place in the country and the lender who can get you there. Find Louisiana Land Bank. Financing for country homes, recreational property, farms and ranches, and agribusiness. Farming is my way of life. I chose this career, but farming chose me. A lot of people ask you what you do and I tell them I'm a farmer. I'm a cattleman. I am a fisherman. I'm a scientist. I'm a steward of the land. I am a farm woman. I am Farm Bureau. I am Farm Bureau. I am Farm Bureau. I am Farm Bureau. I am a Farm Bureau. Before you sweeten your morning joe, before the icing on the cake, Before the sugar hits the shelf. It begins with a family of sugarcane farmers dedicated to growing Louisiana for more than 220 years. 
The Sugar Cane Growers of Louisiana, making life sweeter naturally. Sugar cane, sweet sugar cane. Louisiana oysters, salty, sweet, and delicious. But have you ever thought about what happens to all those oyster shells? Most of them end up in trash cans and landfills. The Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana is changing this with its oyster shell recycling program. And you can help by visiting these participating restaurants. It's a simple and delicious way to restore our coast. The shells will then be used to sustain and rebuild oyster reefs. Remember, once you shuck them, don't just chuck them. Many people in Louisiana find a second career in the kitchen. Twyla Sammy Arinder found a retired state trooper who grew up on a dairy farm, but now spends six months out of the year cooking crawfish in northeast Louisiana. It's quite the tale to tell at Rhett's Tales and Shells in Farmerville. Rhett Trahan grew up in Acadia Parish in the heart of crawfish country. Well, I was born in, in Crowley, Louisiana, down in, in South Louisiana, and uh, spent our time out in the rice fields and stuff. Uh, farm country. Moved there, moved to, from there, moved to Brobridge, Louisiana, where I spent the last 25 years before relocating up here to Farmerville. You know, being from the South, you grow up cooking, you know. I, since a toddler, I watched my mother stir the pot and my, my, my father, and uh, just was something I was always interested in. Rent's Tales and Shells started as a little catering trailer. When he had the opportunity, though, to create a crawfish and shrimp boiling destination, he jumped on it. Uh, everybody comes up here and enjoys themselves with some Cajun music playing in the background with live music on Saturday nights. Frank Thompson is a diner from Union County, Arkansas. We both had the three pound crawfish dinner. Delicious. Worth a drive from El Dorado down here. Trahan drives back to Bro Bridge, the crawfish capital of the world, three times a week for his crustaceans. And as far as his secret to the best tasting, not too spicy, not too mild mud bug, yeah, I guess there is no secret. A little bit of love in every pot, I guess. <laughs> in Farmerville, I'm Tammy Arinder for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture. Rhett's Tales and Shells is open six days a week through May. To plan your trip up to the lake for some crawfish, head over to our website at twilatv.org. Crawfish prices have taken a big dip this week. We've got another two months to go in the season, and they're coming in more abundantly now. Up at Rhett's in Farmerville, they don't have them live, but they're selling for $5.25 a pound boiled, which is pretty good for the northern part of the state. Taking a look around Louisiana, we see a huge drop in prices near New Orleans, where West Wego Seafood has them live for $1.99 a pound and boiled at less than a dollar more, going for $2.95 per pound. You can find them for $2.50 a pound live at A Cajun Crawfish House, where boiled comes in at $4.99 per pound. Finally, Crawfish City in West Monroe is selling them for $2.99 a pound live and $5.69 a pound boiled. Of course, as we tell you each week, shop around for those crawfish and where you can, buy them from a farmer. As the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board always says, when you go to a restaurant, ask before you eat. Still to come on Twyla, will it fit through the door? One rancher tests a leash policy at his local pet store. But first, the legacy of our friend, Michael Dana, lives on. Stay with us. Landowners are minding the Louisiana forest for our grandchildren. A place for wildlife, recreation, lumber for homes. It's the right thing to do. Forestry, covering half our state, all of our hearts. This is the moment I knew his future had no boundaries. There are some moments only the forest can inspire. Find yours at discovertheforest.org. I am a giant bear, bear love you, bamboo. I almost went extinct, but I'm not because of you. I am a grass, and I almost was too. It wasn't for the help of the San Diego Zoo. How about you join us? Save it as a tortoise. We need your help to bring species back, so bring us back from the brink of extinction. 
It's been just a little more than four years since we lost the man who used to stand in front of this monitor and tell you what was happening this week in Louisiana agriculture. However, Michael Dana's legacy lives on through the Michael J. Dana This Week in Louisiana Agriculture Scholarship. The annual award goes to a student enrolled at the LSU Manship School of Mass Communication. Shortly before we shot this show, Louisiana Farm Bureau Assistant to the President Jim Monroe, seen here on the right, presented a donation check to the Dean of the Manship School, Martin Johnson. Also in the picture is Farm Bureau Associate Commodity Director Kyle McCann, who is a really good friend of Mike's. The most recent recipient of the Michael J. Dana Twyla Scholarship is Alexia Charopoulos, a junior mass communication student with a concentration on broadcast journalism. She's already reporting for Tiger TV and says this scholarship will help with the heavy burden of having to pay out-of-state tuition. If you would like to make a donation to the Michael J. Dana Twyla Scholarship, go to our website, twylatv.org, click on the About tab, and you'll see a page called Remembering Mike Dana. Navigate there, and there's a link to the LSU Foundation website at the bottom of that page where you can make a donation and know that all of the money that you give goes toward that scholarship. This week, we have a Twyla boost that I guarantee will make your day and probably your whole week. Did you know that Petco stores have an all-leashed pets are welcome policy? They do. Vincent Browning and Shelly Lumpkin put that policy to the test last month when they brought Oliver, a 1,600-pound African Watusi steer, into a Petco about 20 miles northeast of downtown Houston. Browning posted photos and videos to his Facebook page with the caption, The awesome crew at Petco Atascacita did not disappoint. They welcomed Oliver, the African Watusi, with open arms. Browning said on Facebook, The staff members here are always super friendly and courteous to us. We really enjoy coming to this location, our favorite Petco by far. Oliver, the African Watusi, has his own Facebook page, which describes him as fully trained and available for events. Now, I don't know what events you would need those horns for, but hey, you can always get them. Well, that does it for this edition of Twyla. Be sure to join us next week when Neil Molossan is going to the Crying Eagle Brewery in Lake Charles, where they try to maintain their local flair even as their products are being sold statewide. Until then, subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss a single story. You can also watch all of our stories online at twilatv.org and be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. For all of us here at Twyla, thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again right here next week.